I don't think I really want to be abducted, but that's another story. It would have to be very, I would have to be able to pick the aliens that abduct me, you know? Welcome to part two, you guys. This is Cloud Shadow TV. I'm Jesse, your host of the Alien Abduction Support Group. This is my first series here on my channel. It helps so much if you like and subscribe. That's how I know to keep doing this and that I'm not a crazy person sitting in my apartment talking to a camera. This is part two of the Frederick Valentich disappearance. We support the alien believers. This is where you can come and be like, I believe in aliens and I wanna find out more information. What are they doing? What's going on here? What are UFOs? What are UAPs? I'm confused. Why is Tom from Blink-182 involved? We're going to get into all of that eventually here. So, you know, stick around for the show. This is part two. That means I hope that you watch part one. If you didn't, I'll have a link in the description or like somewhere around here. This is only my second YouTube video, so I'm still learning. But if you like it, please like and subscribe. You know, tell me to make more videos, tell me topics you want me to talk about. But without further ado, let's finish up this Frederick Valentich situation here. So, like I said, the original tape is um, not out there. It's never been found. Apparently, they gave a copy of it to his dad, Guido. But as far as the public is concerned, um, we don't have the actual tape. So, I'm going to just, like I said, read the transcript. So, when I'm over here like this. I'm Fred. When I'm over here, I'm Steve Roby, the FSU guy. So, Steve, Fred. And then I guess the little in-between parts, I'll be in the middle. <laughs> here goes nothing. Melbourne, this is Delta Sierra Julia. Is there any no traffic below 5,000? Delta Sierra Julia, no known traffic. I am to be a large aircraft below 5,000. Delta Sierra Julia, what type of aircraft is it? Delta Sierra Julia, I cannot affirm. It is four bright, it seems to me like landing lights. Delta Sierra Julia. Melbourne, this is Delta Sierra Julia. The aircraft has just passed over me at at least 1,000 feet above. Delta Sierra Julia, roger. And is it a large aircraft? Confirm. Delta Sierra Juliet, or unknown, due to the speed it's traveling, is there any Air Force aircraft in the vicinity? Delta Sierra Juliet, no known aircraft in the vicinity. Melbourne, it's approaching now from due east towards me. Delta Sierra Juliet, open microphone for two seconds. Delta Sierra Juliet, it seems to me that he's playing some sort of game. He's flying over me two, three times at a time. At speeds I could not identify. Delta Sierra Juliet, Roger, what is your actual level? My level is four and a half thousand. Four, five, zero, zero. Delta Sierra Juliet and confirm. You cannot identify the aircraft. Affirmative. Delta Sierra Juliet, Roger, stand by. Melbourne, Delta Sierra Juliet. It's not an aircraft, it is. Open microphone for two seconds. Delta Sierra Juliet, Melbourne, can you describe the er, aircraft? Delta Sierra Juliet, as it's flying past, it's a long shape. Open microphone for three seconds. Cannot identify. More than that, it has such speed. Open microphone for three seconds. Before me, right now, Melbourne. Delta Sierra Juliet, Roger, and how large would the er, object be? Delta Sierra Juliet, it seems like it's stationary. What I'm doing right now is orbiting, and the thing is just orbiting on top of me. Also, it's got a green light and a sort of metallic, like it's all shiny on the outside. Delta Sierra Juliet. Delta Sierra Juliet. Open microphone for five seconds. It just vanished. Delta Sierra Juliet. Melbourne, would you know what kind of aircraft I've got? Is it a military aircraft? Delta Sierra Juliet. Confirm or er, the aircraft just vanished. Say again. Delta Sierra Juliet, is the aircraft still with you? Delta Sierra Juliet, it's a north. Open microphone for two seconds. Now approaching from the southwest. Delta Sierra Juliet. Delta Sierra Juliet. The engine is rough idling. I've got it set at 23, 24, and the thing is coughing. Delta Sierra Juliet, Roger, what are we, what are your intentions? My intentions are uh, to go to King Island, uh, Melbourne. That strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. Two seconds of open microphone. It's hovering, and it's not an aircraft. Delta Sierra Juliet. Delta Sierra Juliet. 17 seconds of open microphone. Delta Sierra Juliet, Melbourne. There is no farther record of any transmissions from the aircraft. The alert 
phase of search and rescue was declared at 1912 hours. At 1933 hours, when the aircraft did not arrive at King Island, the distress phase was declared and search action was commenced. An intensive air, sea, and land search was continued until October 25th, 1978, but no trace of the aircraft was found. So no trace of the aircraft or Fred's body was ever found. The media, the media was taken by this story internationally. So Fred's name was all over the place. And this has actually been cited as some of the best evidence in UFO history. Something strange to note is that the original tape of Fred with Steve Baroby has never been heard in the public. Um, there's rumors that it was given to Fred's dad, Guido, and like this one scientist named Robert Haynes, he's a UFOologist. He claims that he has the tape and I like heard his version, but he put his voice in instead of Steve Roby because apparently that part wasn't in there. And I just don't know if I believe that it's the real thing. So I'm leaving that out. And then also a lot of people say that they have the last like 17 seconds of that weird metallic noise, but I also can't confirm that that's real since like we don't have the tape. So personally, I chose not to include that in my video because I don't know if it's actual evidence and there's so much other like really great solid evidence other than that surrounding this case. So before I get to the theories, I really just want to say a quick trigger warning. Um, there are mentions of suicide and that is one of the theories so if that makes you uncomfortable, skip ahead a little bit or you know come back next time. I totally understand but I am going to get into that theory now. So Fred's family and friends like denied that suicide was a possibility and as we know uh, high functioning depression can be well hidden and it's possible that they just didn't know but I think it's pretty likely that Fred did not commit because this guy was determined like the biggest reason he would have to want to do that is that he kept failing the commercial pilot license test and he was lying about it but the thing is he took these t other tests time and time and time again until he passed like he took one of those other tests five times so who's to say he wouldn't have taken his CPL over and over and over again until he passed I think that's that was Fred's plan and I think I said before he just knew he was gonna eventually pass so he didn't think it was that bad he was lying that he already did not a great plan but I don't think it's like evidence enough that he would commit personally. Skeptics also say that Fred not having a real reason to go to King Island is evidence that he was possibly planning this trip solely for the purpose of committing. But personally, I don't believe that this is true. I mean, he was trying to like sneak crayfish overseas, possibly, I think, over the ocean flying in Australia with a crayfish, not supposed to do that. And I think he was just lying to the aircraft officials, airport officials, because he didn't want to get caught bringing in a, crayf a crayfish. And then, so here's the thing about the crayfish. It's like, okay, so he didn't actually order crayfish and they happened to be sold out of crayfish that day. But Fred's personality was definitely like, oh, I'll just figure it out when I get there. He it wasn't really the type to order one ahead anyways. But his um at the air force one of the squadron leaders squadron leader grandy had told him if he flies to king island to bring him back a crayfish so he probably wanted to like you know butter up this professor a little bit or not professor squadron leader and bring him a crayfish so his plan was go to king island find a crayfish bring it back to his professor be like hey i brought you a crayfish how about an a <laughs> i don't know but you know I do think that maybe he was trying to butter up the professor with a crayfish and so he was willing to take a little risk to get it and so he lied because there was no passengers that he was supposed to pick up. It's pretty obvious that wasn't true but it's less obvious that the crayfish thing was like a total lie. I think that is honestly probably the real story. He just didn't plan well for it and he would have gotten there and been like, oh man, there's no crayfish left guess I gotta fly here again and that's the other thing he was a student pilot so I do think that he really just wanted to fly he he loved flying it was like his passion so I think this was just another excuse to get up in the air and kind of at sunset at night he probably thought it would be pretty and cool 
and you know unfortunately this happened another kind of piece of support for this theory is that he didn't call king island ahead of time and ask them to turn on the landing lights so this is one of his first night flights but the thing is it was night so sunset was supposed to happen at 8 50 p.m and last light was at 9 21 he would have landed at 7 he was last heard from at 7.12, and he was supposed to land at, like, 7.33. So, it wouldn't have really been dark, but he did know that King Island was closed, so if he needed the landing lights turned on, he wouldn't be able to get them turned on right away when he got there if he didn't call ahead and do it. This could be a beginner's mistake. He could have thought he had enough light. I don't know, but personally, I think it's more likely a mistake than evidence that he wasn't ever planning on landing. Rhonda considered Fred a very good pilot. You know, that was his, that was her man. She said he was a good pilot and, but she did kind of say that he had strange habits. So these concerned the use of the radio. You know, the, that means the microphone that he's talking to the FSU on, which is where we got this conversation from. And she said that she was aware that he usually clicked the microphone button after transmitting and that he never put it back on the rack and he would usually set it in his lap. And sometimes when he did this, he would put it in his lap, it would activate the microphone. He also apparently had the habit of polishing the microphone on his finger like that, sorry, or I guess on his sleeve like that so those are what those would sound like I guess he would do that before he used the microphone sometimes I guess a out of habit she also said that he had long legs and that he would scoot the seat back like part way through the flight when he got uncomfortable and maybe this could account for the metallic noise that she had heard talked about in the newspapers and one thing that the investigators did mention was that Rhonda seemed to enjoy the attention of the frenzy of the news around the situation, but that she also, they said she did not appear to be unduly concerned and gave the impression that she expected to see him again. She claimed that there was a permanency to her relationship with Frederick and that they had plans to become engaged. She seemed to think that she would see him again, which is sweet, and you know, maybe she was like swept up in the craziness of the news and she thought it was fun, but yeah. Apparently, Guido, Fred's dad, kind of dismissed the relationship as of no consequence, but at that age, maybe you don't tell your dad so much. Who knows how seriously Fred really took Rhonda. We don't know. And then also during the search and rescue, they actually spotted some wreckage, possibly, but they had to fly a little higher to get a clear view of it, and then they lost it. So that was seen as something that they could have possibly missed. Another theory is that this is was just a hoax gone wrong. People think that because Frederick was like a fan of aliens, I guess the books and the movies that he liked and kind of brought up UFO sometimes, that that meant that maybe he was faking all of this in order to be like remembered and make a big scene maybe he had a plan to come back and have this whole big alien abduction story but it went wrong like I don't know what they're thinking but I just need to say for all of the members of the alien abduction support group just because you like aliens doesn't mean that it's a hoax okay I would never do a hoax look at all my alien stuff if I am abducted it's real I'm not hoaxing you people I promise Please don't think that I hoaxed it just because I like aliens. I would not do that. I would really be abducted, okay? So like, know that. Just know it's not a hoax. I was really abducted, but hopefully it never happens. Anyways, Fred. So even his girlfriend said that he only had an average interest in UFOs. So to me, that seems like pretty good evidence that he wasn't crazy obsessed. And he did say that he had seen that UFO and he had heard that like classified information from the Australian government about aliens. So, and he was, he didn't tell, he told his family that he had read stuff, but he didn't tell them what he read. So he did keep his commitment to the Australian government by not leaking alien government secrets. But he did tell them that he knew them, which is, you know, I would be pressing for answers. But like I said, most of the witnesses actually said that they never had heard Fred mention UFOs. 
Um, the only people that really did were Rhonda and his parents. So it was kind of like a private little interest. I don't think it was anything he was crazy obsessed with. But yeah, people believe that he either, like, it was a hoax or that he planned to land somewhere. He wanted some sort of fame from it. But I find this unlikely because of his fear of water and he didn't have a seaplane. So he couldn't have landed in the water and where he would have had to land in Cape Otway, he would have been found. He also could not have been that far out of the circle that we know about because like I said, the um, King Island airport was closed. Like their radios go a certain range. So like he could talk to Melbourne for a certain distance and he was talking to Melbourne when this happened, which means he was in the certain ring of an area and Cape Otway falls in that ring but not a, like, it's pretty big, but he would have had to been somewhere completely wrong in order to have gotten away with this, and I feel like they would have seen him on radar or something. I don't know. To me, this doesn't seem very likely. He also wasn't a strong swimmer. He was a newer pilot. Why would he, like, purposefully land in the middle of nowhere just to do an alien hoax when he's, like, really committed to becoming a pilot? A lot of skeptics think that the, this was actually a case of disorientation because it was one of Fred's first times flying at night. But as we established, it wasn't night yet. It was sunset and not even really quite sunset. I don't know, but people still bring this up as um, a factor. He could have been disoriented. Sorry, I'm worried I'm going to go over my time because I filmed a little over last time. Being a YouTuber is hard, guys. It's hard but I like it. I'm, I'm doing my best. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you like my video. I hope I sound good. I hope my lighting's fine. Um, my mom said she's going to judge me on it. So Jennifer, I hope you're pleased. I'm going to read this theory because it's kind of, okay. One theory suggests that he was spiraling downward, much like the way JFK Jr. passed away in what is called a graveyard dive. And Fred was disoriented by a tilted horizon, which happens when your visual information and the information on your instruments do not agree. So like when you're looking around outside, it doesn't make sense to what the machine is telling you is happening. But as a pilot, you have to know the machine is right. So maybe this was happening and Fred just wasn't a skilled enough pilot to trust the machines over his own mind is what they're saying and that's what caused the disorientation. This would cause Fred to fly too low and spiral and they thought that maybe he saw his own plane's reflection in the ocean and thought that was the other aircraft. But this is honestly easily debunked because he was talking to the FSU people for like six minutes and in the plane he was in, if he was like upside down and spiraling, he would have crashed in way faster than six minutes. He could not have sustained that for as long as he was having the conversation. The plane could literally not last a minute upside down. Another wild skeptic theory suggests that he like couldn't see clearly and became disoriented by the horizon, that tilted horizon again. And he saw Venus, Mercury, Mars, and the brightest star, which is called Antor. And these formations together made like a diamond shape and he mistaked it as an aircraft. This completely ignores Fred's description of something metallic and the green light that he said he saw, so that one's too out there for me. Somebody else said something about like if a little bit of oil leaked out of the engine and then got on the window, then like you know how when there's like a reflection on gas, like it makes that weird rainbow, like maybe that happened and that disoriented him like crazy while he was flying, but like I just a stretch it's it's a stretch a little too stretchy next then we have more skeptics okay we're getting to the fun theory soon but we gotta give these skeptics their moment here's your moment aurora australius this is this is aurora australius's moment okay this is aurora australius's moment and she's beautiful honestly she's really beautiful a man named john mill claimed to see some Aurora Australis, and this is like the Northern Lights look, but I guess it's the Southern Lights. I don't know, don't quote me on that, but I'll pull up some pictures around here somewhere. Yeah, okay, it's in the Southwestern si skies. I had that in my notes. But it's an atmospherical, 
atmospheric display of light. This dude, John Mills, thought that maybe that's what Fred saw, but honestly, still ignores the shiny metallic thing. I feel like you can tell the difference between, like, natural phenomenon and a plane flying and orbiting around you and messing with you. I don't know. Seems a little crazy to get those two things mixed up to me, but I'm just an alien abductor chin support group leader so what do i know so fred was flying over the bass Strait, and because the weather conditions were so good that day the wreckage should have been found because of the conditions but unfortunately they weren't one oil slick was found and examined but i guess the sample wasn't that great but they still determined that it most likely wasn't from the airplane because of the oil was organic and not the type of oil that would be used in the Cessna plane that Fred was using. There was also, so five years later, this cow flap on a beach in Flinders Island. This was in 1983, I believe. It washed up and they thought it was from, it was definitely from a Cessna. Some of the like numbers of the like coded whatever the code they use to know what the plane parts are, like, some of it matched up to the Cessna, but not all the way, and they couldn't, like, say it definitely was. It was just from, like, the series of Cessnas built at that time. But the thing is, two other Cessnas reported losing that same part much closer to Flinders Island, so it's much more likely that it was from one of those planes. In order to have been from Fred's plane, it would have had to like go really far on the sea floor in like not very deep water. And while it's possible, it would have had to like slush through so much debris and other, you know, stuff that's at the bottom of the ocean, reefs and plants and other junk. It's just very unlikely that it would have gotten that far to Flinders Island. Some people say that that's evidence that it was a piece of Fred's plane. Personally, I believe that even if Fred's plane was found, that is an evidence to me that says he was not having an interaction with a UFO or aliens or something because just because you find the plane, like I would need to see much clearer evidence that that didn't happen because the stuff he said is suspicious at best. So I would need much more information than just a piece of the plane to believe that nothing happened that was out of the ordinary that day. But the Bass Strait is kind of uh, like a Bass Strait Triangle. Like, you know, the Bermuda Triangle, but the Bass Strait Triangle. The thing is, it is very typically rough water in the Bass Strait, and it's, like, not the most safe area to be um, driving your boat around and whatnot. But, um, like, all of the ocean, like, really, you have to really know what you're doing to get around correctly. But here are some of the strange things that happened in the Bass Strait. In 1920, a ship went missing, and then two aircrafts went looking for it, and they also went missing. Strange lights were also reported to be seen that night. In 1942, strange lights were reported by a fisherman that looked like a doorway of light, which I guess is how some people describe portals. In 1944, a dark shadow flew by a bomber before it disappeared and I think okay don't quote me on this but um there's this what's that what's the new band that the guy from Nirvana's in the Foo Fighters the Foo Fighters is referring to like World War II planes that saw these weird dark shadows and like maybe UFOs and stuff in the sky I'll have to look into that in a farther video but I this kind of comes in a little bit here in the Bass Strait, <laughs> World War II, Dark Shadows. Need to look up more about the Foo Fighters. Grew up with some of the songs, though. They're cool. Oh, I missed one. In 1934, a plane carrying 10 passengers vanished, and no evidence of the plane was ever found. But an oil slick was actually found in that situation, which an oil slick is evidence of that's where a plane um, sunk in the ocean. But yeah, 17 planes were lost in the Bass Strait in World War II alone. So something to think about. The Bass, Strait, the Bass Strait is already kind of like a strange area. So this Reddit user actually had an interesting theory. I can't remember their name. I'm sorry. But um, I like this theory. And I was kind of thinking something along the same lines. Um, maybe it's a military conspiracy. They said that the first generation of stealth aircraft 
was in the 1960s and 70s, and it would not have been detected by radar. Fred himself was concerned that it was a military plane, and an accident could have occurred with the military plane and Fred's plane, and the Australian government chose to cover it up and let people think it was a UFO in order for them to not get blamed for the incident. (laughs) It's a pretty good theory. Also, because this is the alien abduction support group, we must say that some people also believe that governments have UFO technology and have used it in the past to fake abductions. So that is it's a theory that I like. I like that theory. Good theory, Reddit user. Please like and subscribe if you watch this video <laughs> and tell me who you are. I will give you credit. <laughs> I'm Jesse. This is Cloud Chatter TV. I appreciate you. I'm going to talk about aliens more. I come in peace. <laughs>